Good afternoon, everyone. You are welcome to our second presentation in 2022 at the Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies. So now we have started a fortnightly presentation. In the past year, we we're doing it weekly, but uh, to have time for more activities, we decided to make it fortnightly now. So this is our second presentation and our presenter today is no other than Dr. Michael Olusegun Fadjuibe from the Department of Fine and Applied Arts, Obafemi Awolowo University in Nigeria, Osu State, Nigeria. Um, before we go further, to talk about his presentation today on this platform. We are going to say, uh, uh, read out a brief uh, uh, profile of Mr. Uh, of Dr. Fadri. He has his PhD in African art studies. So he's an artist. This is interesting because we would think uh, the arts may not have anything to do with migration, but his presence here is going to educate us better on how art is related to migration. Art historian and a senior lecturer in the Department of Fine and Applied Arts of Afemi Awolowo University, Ilefe, Nigeria. His research and publication, which delve into issues in contemporary Nigerian art, are focused generally on the sociology of visual arts and aesthetics, the artist process and products, as well as their meanings and functions in society. His research works, which yielded published articles in local and international journals, also explore the relevance, adaptation, and sustainability of indigenous Yoruba art aesthetics and values. His professional practice has been in the aspect of sculptural poetry. Beyond aesthetic appraisal of artworks, his research is focused on the intersections of the arts and society and how visual art could be a vehicle of development in society. He holds the view that art is authentically a tool of social transformation, status definition, and critical discourse. Like I said before now, he has published in many local and international journals, and his latest publication, which is a book, is titled Eurocentrism and the Place of Ancient Egypt in African Art Scholarship in Bewaji, J.A. and Agoro A, who are the editors, and this book was published in 2018. 2018. So we are very happy to have uh, this uh, right. artist with us today, and I hope we are going to be learning from him. And his topic for this presentation is migration and memory. Moyo, okay, did this creative or this? That title sounds so sweet and lovely, and I'm sure we are going to have a lovely time with Dr. Fadu Ibe. Dr. Fadu Ibe, you have um, 30, 35 minutes to talk to your slides, while um, we we'll use the remaining minutes for questions and answers. And I quickly want to tell you that um, when it's time for questions and answers, um, we, are, we always want all the questions to come in, and then you now respond to all. So you just be noting them down. Then you respond to all at the end of the, uh, people making comments or questions. So you are welcome and I welcome all of you. So over to you, Dr. Fadi. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am. I just want to start by saying uh, a very big thank you to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Olufemi Peters and uh, the Director uh, uh, migration and Global Studies, Dr. Zoria Arneto, for inviting me to present uh, this uh, 
a presentation. And the presentation is titled Migration and Memory Moyo Kediji's Creative Odyssey. I want to start by uh, talking about concept and meaning of art. Like uh, uh, the director said, one may be wondering what's the connection between heart and migration. As a matter of fact, heart has a lot to do with migration, especially in the aspects you know, of memory, the aspect of recollecting. So what is art? One may want to ask, heart is a human phenomenon. In other words, it means that everybody makes art. Every culture produces art. It's natural to man to make art. According to Herbert Reed, he says that man begins to draw or to make art before he begins to learn, before he begins to write, or before he begins to read. So art is a human phenomenon. But it's not just humans alone that produce art. Even animals make art. But one thing about that, about, about man or human making art is that it's only human beings that produce works of art to effectively communicate passion and also to discuss issues that are pertinent to them. And that is one thing that is very crucial to this particular study. Art is also a reflection of people's philosophy and culture. Every culture, be it Yoruba, India, you know, Chinese, the Ibu, they have a way, they have a philosophy guiding the creation or the making of art. In fact, as a matter of fact, art making has to do with memory, you know, recollection. And then for art, as to actually, you know, uh, uh, to, to actually capture the philosophy or culture of the people, then you see art as a tangible material or a, an object in which the artist, the producer, the viewer, the user, the patrons of the art, they have something to say. It is a common uh, say in my profession that behind every work of art, there's a story. The story according to the artist, the story according to the user, the viewer, the patron, the collectors. Because every work of art is a social, you know, you know, thing. It's a social, you know, uh, 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 material that everybody, you know, has access to. And because of this, everybody has a way of interpreting and relating to works of art. Art is also a social construct. What do I mean by a social construct? In other words, because we have different stories behind works of art, because we have different people involving, involved in the creation of works of art, then you have different meaning. Art carries meanings. The meaning according to the artist, the meaning according to the buyer. There's a reason why I want to buy you know, a piece of art or a, a well-decorated you know, chair or a city. There's a reason for that. And that reason is, is the meaning, is the construction. And this is what you know, artists leverage on whenever they are making art. And art has a social context because art is used as a tool of recording and explaining the past. And not only a tool of recording the past, but also a key factor in telling human history. It has been said, and we know it is in archive and, and, and literature, that the history of the world and the history of most cultures all over the world are reconstructed based on works of art that have been produced right from the prehistoric era up to now. And so if you want to know more about art, then you have to understand that it has a social context. Art is also a tool of change and social reengineering. What do I mean by that? When we produce works of art, the artist as an individual, as a member of the larger social community, you know, he has a reason. He has been interrogating, he has been you know, relating with the issues around him. It could be the issue of politics. It could be the issue of uh, uh, economics. It could be the issue of uh, culture, generally. And so he has a way of trying to keep into the discourse in the society. In other words, you know, art is a a tool of critical in inquiry for people to be able to spontaneously relate with the issues around. Let me give an instance. We have the cartoons. You know, when you open the pages of your newspaper, then you see the cartoon. Just in brief, very spontaneous. You get the message either on corruption, 
you get a message either on the child trafficking, and that is what we mean by art being a tool of change and social reengineering. The instrumentalists believe that art, if it will you know, be useful to society, it must make us more humane. It must make us more responsible. This responsibility is captured, is codified, you know, by artists, maybe using colors, using form, using styles, using so many things that are packed together. And that is why when we come across certain works of art, you say, wow, you just pause for a while. You want to know what is going on. At times, you know, you are rooted to where you are standing because you want to understand more what goes on in the mind of the artist at the point of conceptualizing the work of art or at the point of creating to the extent that, you know, you get to the point of assimilation or talk about, you know, the, you know, aspect of the appreciation. Art, finally, is also a journey. It's a lifetime experience. I'm an artist, whether I'm a lecturer, whether I teach, whatever I do, you know, I create works of art. The life of an artist, you know, is configured within the social environment in which he found himself. And so, you know, let me just you know, uh, start the example of uh, the Yoruba. Yoruba believe that an artist is a sojourner, somebody who moves from place to place, from one point to another, returning, you know, also departing. You know, he moves from one place to another, and the Yoruba refer to, you know, the, the artist as an array. Array is just a permanent stranger. He doesn't stay in one point. And you see artists all over the world, when you look at what they produce, you know, they get ideas from here and there, and they use this thing to project their intentions to the people. Because heart is simply a journey, a lifetime experience. There's nothing we can do about it. Let me just quickly read, you know, uh, remind us about uh, what Drew has said. He said, journey connotes constant newness. As artists move or migrate from one place to another, let's say it shifts from Abuja to Ife, from Ife to Tokyo, you know, there are certain newness that occur. There are unceasing explorations of ideas, countless discoveries about people, about language, about issues, about so many things, about histories, and there will be revelations from inside. All these things are put together by the artist, you know, so that, uh, you know, he can be able to achieve, you know, the purpose of changing society or reorientating the society, social reengineering. That is about the concept of art. Now, what is the connection between art and migration and between migration and memory? Art and migration, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, migration, you know, is, is in two parts. It's either forced or, or voluntary. You know, it is forced because of wars, you know, conflicts, you know, tensions here and there. And then, let me just give us an instance, you know, uh, the Boko Haram, uh, the Fulani Hesmen, when they, you know, attack, you know, the certain communities, the people who are forcefully uprooted from the original to as a forced, I mean, migration as a forced uh, movement is that of a transatlantic slave trade and then uh, trans you know, trade, uh, slave trade. But migration could also be voluntary. Migration is voluntary because, you know, people are looking for a better way, you know, of, you know, of living. A better way of uh, the better, you know, a, a better way of getting the best out of life. So they move. You have people that move from Africa to Europe, from Africa to US, from India, Latin America to US because they want better education, better environment, better pay, better job, so that they can be able, you know, to effectively discharge their duties as humans. You know, people have argued that uh, have, you know that, that migration is not just about. Uh, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not just about movement, you know, that uh, you have to, you know, consciously relocate from one continent to another. No, migration is simply moving from one place to another. But in this discourse, you can say migration has to be do with moving from a particular cultural, economic, you know, social or intellectual location to another. And for the purpose of pursuing personal and group goals, for the purpose of creating new identities and reinforcing certain existing convictions. People have reason why they move. And the migration, you know, uh, from studies, you know, you realize that the migration, you know, involves constant arrivals and departures. People move continuously, continually from one place to another. 
And the, it means migration is a continuous narrative you know, of identity and self, it, it, of relocation, of rediscovery, of you know, effort to make sense out of, ex, of human existence. You know, it has to do with the changing realities of the contemporary world. Because what obtained in Nigeria may not obtain in Ghana, what obtained in you know, Tokyo may not obtain you know, in Saudi Arabia. So if I find that you know, Saudi Arabia will be better, I find myself you know, meeting. You know, moving from where I find myself, you know, to Saudi Arabia because it involves, you know, realities of the contemporary world. If there's hunger in a place and there are, there are, there are, there are plenty in another place, I move. It's natural. Migration is natural. People move continuously. In other words, we are saying that uh, when we focus on migration, you know, as a case study for the artist, we realize that uh, the individual memory is enriched. The memory, the mindset. You know, the storehouse where the artist draws inspirations and revelation in creating works of art that will change society, that will generate, you know, critical discourse. That memory is enriched and the mind is also enlightened because one cannot just, you know, be, you know, a champion, you cannot just, you know, be you know, in one place and think that they want to obtain a life, you know, is all and all. It doesn't obtain this way. But by the time you move from one place to another, you realize that you are just an individual. And then you know, without you, you know, life continues to move. So the mind is enlightened and knowledge is increased, you know, and that is why you discover that the artist, you know, understanding of the world around him is increased. His knowledge is increased. His understanding of style, of form, of patterns, of colors, and all kinds of material that we use in the making of art, you know, becomes more expansive. And he could see the world not from his own perception, but from the perception of the social, larger social you know, uh, community. And what is memory? The relationship between memory and critical expression in it is that uh, you know, memory is everything. In fact, without memory, you know, humans cannot function. I'm talking to us now, this lecture based on recollection of what I've read, what I've heard, what I've seen, what I've discussed with people, you know, issues of life. Memory is crucial. Without memory, we are just nothing. We are just like vegetables. And then that's not good enough. And that is why memory is very crucial to creative expression. Because like I said, it's the storage of our identity as artists, as human beings. It's also a state of loss of forgetfulness. You know, when I get, for instance, I want to produce the work of art and I don't know how to go about it. I'll just relax and meditate because I find myself in a state of forgetfulness. I'm at loss and I want to do better. And I want to quickly say this thing before I move on, that memory is one of the seeds of, you know, of the mind, of the human mind. It's a place whereby we store our ideas, our challenges, our issues. And that is why even for students you know, of learning, you know, it is a, a, you know, a storehouse whereby you know, during examination, you are able to tap into the deep recess of your memory and bring out ideas and bring out, if you remember what you are taught, and so you are able to do justice in the examination, whatever you, know, you want to do. Memory is also key to identity and self-discovery. You know, who am I? I'm a Yoruba. You know me first and foremost by my name. I'm Michael Oluseko Fajibi. It has to do with my language. My language you know, reflects in my name. You know, my culture also reflects in my name, Fajibi. And Fajibi is drawn from Ifa, you know, I mean, one of the indigenous uh, religions in Africa, you know, and uh, we all know that, uh, you know, uh, memory has to do with time and space. And you see, the issue of time and space, they are more or less like illusion. You know, we can now see that uh, the distance between Ilefe and Abuja has been breached because of technology. So time is just, you know, the creation of man, likewise space and memory, you know, it has you know, a, a lot to do when it comes to artistic expression. Because time is a constant renegotiation of our existence. And it is conditioned by other variables like place, distance, you know, culture, language, and the likes. In other words, memory involves recollecting, remembering our realities. It talks about remembering our realities and remembering the knowledge that we have used over time. And it's also, you know, at a point whereby we begin to contest and uh, contextualize ideas. And that is what we do as artists. We, we contest, we recontextualize forms, images, ideas, because we are 
depending or banking on our memory of our experiences. You know, memory has to do with reproducing or relocating images in a familiar terrain. For instance, you know, the, uh, the, the, the focus of this study, you know, Moyo KDG, you know, uh, even though it's in Nigeria, or, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in America, it's been there for over 30 years, and then, you know, the works that he produced at times that basically, you know, uh, uh, talk about Yoruba culture. You find these works being displayed in museums, galleries in the US. What he's trying to do is trying to reproduce and relocate such images in a familiar terrain, even though at times the terrain may not even be familiar at all. Still on memory, in conclusion, can say all art is based on memory. An artist's key is a function of our memory. As artists, creativity you know, depends on the ability of the artist to leverage on the encounters, as memories and experiences, to interrogate and to interpret concepts visually, and also to contextualize and intellectualize ideas that are correct in times across time and space. And so the link between art, migration, and memory is simply imaginative contemplation. When the artist is able to think, to meditate, to reflect, to muse on what he has encountered over time, to muse you know, on the ideas of leadership, governance, poverty. You know, so many ideas like that. You can now see that uh, you know, he needs to contemplate. He needs to think, but the artist cannot imagine anything unless he gets to a point of contemplation. And he cannot contemplate unless, you know, he begins to use memory or he take, you know, he resort to his memory bank to bring out those things, those encounters that he has over the years. Therefore, imaginary contemplation is just an intersection between conception, between the creation, between the assimilation, and also the appreciation of what's over. It is necessary for us to just note that uh, uh, the idea of migration, the idea of art, and then the high idea of uh, you know memory is not uh, really new. You know, uh, it has been discussed you know by scholars you know uh, over the years. You know, some scholar focus on the migration and social evolution, in which you know they focus on the ethnic consciousness, and some focus on migrant-related issues arising for conflicts, contention. You know, migrant settlers like Kutubi, xenophobia, racialism, imbalance, and injustice. You know, scholars have written on that. And there are also, you know, documents on literature on migration and creative expression. And then in these, you know, previous studies, I realized that, uh, you know, scholars are focused on art, you know, and critical expression as a tool of identity construction. You know, they also, you know, also uh, uh, note that, uh, you know, African cultural relations and continuity are vigorously enforced. You know, I talk about language and food. It's also part of, you know, critical culture. You know, some of them also focus on transformation, like Falola, Afolabi, Adesanya, Adejumo, Jegede. They focus on the transformation of indigenous African arts in the Americas. And a few studies have also focused on selected African-American and diaspora African artists, like Inziogu, 2000, Campbell, Harris, Drewa, and Lugufuwa, among others. So many literatures have been there. And in these studies, you know, some of these scholars focus, you know, on maybe two, three, four, five, you know, a number of artists, you know, just to discuss. But for the purpose of this discourse, our focus is on Moyo Okiriji as an individual, as just a lone voice over there in the Americas. You know, at times he will come to Nigeria, at times you find himself in Ethiopia migrating from one place to another, as long as, you know, it will enrich his memory bank, as long as it will enrich, you know, the quality, you know, of his creativity. And so we are also examining, you know, how he has used art over the years, even before he got to America, as tools of construction and deconstruction. What do I mean by construction? Because OKBG engraves the artist, you know, he, he engraves, you know, the mind of the viewers of works of art, the original story. You know, one thing about migration is that, uh, you know, people have said a lot of things about Africa, they have said a lot of things about 
You got Nigeria, for instance, you know, it was white, black, you know, was white versus black. But he tries as an artist, just like a novelist, you know, to reconstruct or to construct the story of the Africa and Africans, you know, without the stain of colonialism. Even the language that we use to interact, you know, as the lingua franca, is a product of colonialism. And we can only do justice, you know, when we begin to interact. So the best bet for him is to present these issues in two dimensional forms, in painting, in drawings, at times in an installation, so that people can relate to these particular issues. And by the construction, what I mean, he exposed art to protest. So many of his art, you know, talk about protest, contest, you know, to confront colonial or what I call political uh, post-colonial misadventures of our leaders. Leaders in the past from independence, before independence, they have done a lot of injustice to the site of the hybrid Nigeria. And he used this part as a tool to deconstruct. Now, don't be bothered about what is happening in Nigeria. Don't be bothered about the way they describe you, about the way they define you, you know. It's the order against, you know, against you know, these people. We against the others. They define us in so many ways. And so he has tried over the years to use his art to deconstruct so many misgivings, so many, you know, errors, erroneous, you know, issues about it, like the issue of corruption. It's not only Nigeria that is corrupt, even America is corrupt, even, you know, you know, the European world is corrupt, you know, because, you know, the very, you know, source of the wealth of Europe and America today, you know, is, has to do with corruption. They, they evacuated a lot of treasures, a lot of money, even to tomorrow. They are still mining gold. They are still mining so, so many precious you know, minerals, you know, in Africa. You know, at the expense of who? At the expense of the development of Africans. And this is what is used, especially in the areas of religion, culture, and social engineering. And this is when your KDG in his, in his studio, shortly after he arrived you know, in the US in 1992. KDG, you know, further need you know, to migrate to the US. In 1992, he actually left you know, the shore of this country in 1992. And so I present to us uh, Muyo Okidiji, a contemporary Nigerian artist, a diasporan African artist, a trans African artist, and a global artist. You know, he's a Nigerian and he practices his heart for now. And his heart is relevant for now. And that's why we refer to him as a contemporary Nigerian artist. As a diasporan, you know, African artist, he's been there for 30 years. And for 30 years, he's been working, he's been curating works of art, he's been producing works of art, you know, just as somebody is still going to an exile in a different, you know, uh, geographical location. It's also a trans African artist. What do I mean by that? There's something about Okediji that is so, you know, uh, you know, interesting to me as a scholar is that you can hardly pigeonhole his work while you are trying to, you know, situate his work historically. You, you find that, that uh, you know, the more you try to do that, the more he produces works that can only be defined in his own creation or by his own, you know, epistemologies. He has a way, you know, of creating his own work. And he begins to say, wow, what is this again? You know, you cannot really pin your home A Nigerian artist is based in America. He's a Yoruba person. He's a Nigerian. You know, you see all these things in his work because he creates his own vocabulary. He creates his own ideology, just to make sure that he is able to pass message across. And this ideology is enclosed or is, you know, uh, supported by what I call ethno aesthetics. Ethno aesthetics simply means using uh, ethnic criteria to produce art. Ethnic criteria, ethno aesthetics. Now, using ethnic criteria, you know, it could be proverbs. It could be language, it could be rituals, it could be sacrifice, such that are, you know, uh, things that are indigenous to the people of Africa. You know, this is one of his ideology. And when you look at his paintings, whether installation, body art, you know, drawings, you can unwrap them through ethno aesthetics. And also, post coloniality, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, is a strong believer, you know, in African personality. And then African past, and he has a lot of pride in African culture. And so he used the ideology of postcoloniality to enforce this in his works. 
And there's something that, uh, you know, uh, we must know about Okediji, uh, just like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci of the Renaissance era. Okediji grew up in the midst of scholars, even intellectuals, both at the communal level, you know, university, I mean, I mean, at the communal level or intellectual level, you know, it developed, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ideas. He grabbed a lot of information here and there. You know, from Habalis, you find him in the midst of, uh, you know, uh, literary playwrights. So many people, he mingled, he did not discriminate. Today, you find him among intellectuals. Tomorrow, you find him among the, you know, uh, uh, the rulership. Tomorrow, you find him in the village, you know, working with peasants, working with people, you know, of low educational status, trying to gain. I remember one of our encounters, he told me, he said, the African artist, the man on the street, that woman, that woman over there, the indigenous artist, is the storehouse of our vocabulary, of our cultural vocabulary, of our artistic vocabulary, that we don't need to, you know, ask them to come to the university environment, but rather we have to go there and learn from them. And so OKDG has, you know, uh, presented himself as an apprentice to so many of these, you know, indigenous, you know, African artists. Of course, you know, his childhood was born, you know, education and training, work experience, publications, all this one, you know, would be made available uh, later on. But I want us to just, because of my time, I want to talk about some of his works and uh, actually help us to understand the impact of migration and memory on his creativity. You know, in all his journeys from Nigeria to America, from America back to Nigeria, to South Africa, to Ethiopia, you know, he has never forgotten his roots. And then one of, the, uh, of his paintings is titled Remembering. You know, he produced in 1992 when he was about to, uh, to travel to the US. And re remembering in particular, you know, gives me something, you know, to think about because, you know, the work is an interplay of creativity, memory, critical thinking and skill. You know, it gives the viewers, you know, an insight into the history of migration, you know, the horror that took place in Africa when, the first, you know, uh, uh, explorer, Vasco da Gama, visited Elvina, Ghana, in 1420, you know, and then before you realize it, you know, Africans become merchandise, you know, that they need to, 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 to transport, like cargoes, to the U.S., to Brazil, the new land, sugarcane plantation. And this is what he's trying to capture, remembering. So we remember, you know, say, by the rivers of Babylon, here we stand, so we remember, you know, when we left Zion, when we left Nigeria, when we left Ghana, when we were taken as slaves from Gambia, from Cameroon, from the, you know, South Africa, and what have you, from the Congo, to different parts of, of the world. It's, it's very interesting for us to note that the works that Europeans or American scholars, you know, dub as fetish. You know, they are the works now that, uh, you know, they use in establishing so many museums over there in America. And then many of us will agree with me that recently in Nigeria, uh, the British These little treasures are mostly works of art, like, you know, that of the Lee Bronze, Remember the attack on the, the palace of the king, uh, Nubasi Overami, in 1897. Everything that matter, that is artistic, were looted and taken to America. And so this work, remembering, is a reminder of the evil of colonialism, through which the white man, under the pretext of trade, you know, and missionary activities, hijacked the sovereignty of Africans. Until tomorrow, we are still at the mercy of the Europeans. We are seen at the mercy of this, of, 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 our, of our colonialists, you know, and that is why it's very, it's not very funny that uh, most, you know, African, you know, uh, uh, countries and government, they cannot stand on their own. They have to go to Europe, to America, you know, like beggars, asking for fun, asking for help, and they did this thing to us. So can you use this word, remembering, he got there, he remember who he read, he studied, he heard from people, from, he read from archives, the evil of colonialism. 
And as a result, he produced this one. This one is also middle passage. The one thing about Moyo Kiri is that you know is a very prolific artist, multi-dimensional, you know, <laughs> multi-talented artist. And at times you won't begin to wonder, you know, the kind of energy. At the age of 66, you know, almost since now, that you begin to wonder where he got this energy. Another, another painting is titled Middle Passage, 1992. You know, he produced this, and this is also talking about, you know, um, the effects of migration, forced migration in this case, the effects, you know, of uh, you know, colonialism, you know, a slave trade and the likes on Africans. You can see from the images there, you know, you see the drum. I think when they go there, they still remember that we have a drum. So this side, you know, of the painting, you can see the calabash. It is a special calabash, you know, uh, I mean, taken from Nigeria, you know, well patterned, well decorated. Now all these images and forms and colors are just to tell the story. You can see toward this side, you know, the white man in his, you know, uh, his cap, you know, like that of a you know, engineer, you know, with a whip, you know, riding an imaginary horse and whipping the slaves to find themselves in this valley, this valley of no return. They were glued here. They don't know how to escape. It's terrible. Another one is fear where, you know, you can hear Okiriji in 1994. Like I said, you know, it doesn't stay in one place. Okiriji is an array, you know, a permanent stranger. So then you find him in America 10 years later, you find him in Utopia two years later, you know, you move to another level. And here he's trying to commemorate, you know, his so many farewells. You know, according to him, he, he believed that, uh, you know, memory has to do with a lot of, uh, you know, arrivals and departures. And there's no better work to depict that except for this farewell produced in 1994. You can see the Dutchman. The Dutchman is a very popular, you know, painting of Moyo Kiriji. Uh, it has been reviewed and a lot of critical discourse has gone into this work because, you know, it's like a wake up, wake up call for Africans. And, you know, the Dutch, you know, represents not just the Dutchman, you can see the Frenchman, you can see the Englishman, you can see, you know, anybody, you can see the Americans. You know, this is the Dutchman. It's, it's a painting, you can see this, so many colors. The, the, the colors are diverse, and yet they are very harmonious, talking about, you know, the, the war of the colonialists. Now, the, this one is the Ogunic exploit. It is very interesting for us to know that uh, uh, Moyo Kediji uh, is a traditional, you know, believer. He was born into a Christian home, you know, I didn't want to bother us with uh, you know, talking about, you know, uh, his life from birth, you know, to now. But this work, you know, reflects his belief, you know, in African culture, his belief, you know, in African religious system, belief system, you know, and he believed that uh, uh, no religion is more superior or more important than any other religion. So the idea of saying that Christianity or Islam, you know, are far better than traditional African, you know, our religions are uh, to him, you know, is a form of fallacy, because you know what you believe, I know what I believe. Even for me as a Christian, you know, Apostle Paul said, I know whom I believe, I know what I believe. So for KBG, he believes in the traditions of his forefathers. And he tries as much as possible to project that in his painting. And so you may not want to listen, you don't want to hear, because it's natural for others to give attention or to give opportunity to, to Christians or, or Muslims. But for traditional believers, you don't want to hear about that. And this painting tells the stories of Ugu, the Yoruba god of Hayo. And this one's fragments. You can see Ugu Okediji, you know, he produces, you know, a lot of work. And like this, uh, very wide, you know, work, you know, as wide as a wall. And this one is tied to fragments, produced in 2008. And this, more or less, also the effects of migration, the effects of colonialism, the effects of post coloniality, the effects of uh, misrule. Of the people, fragments of idea, fragments of beliefs, fragments of issues. At times, you don't know what to do. Should I pay the school fees of my children, or should I prepare food for them? You don't know. Fragments, confusion, bits and pieces here and there. This one, Okediji, you know, 
like I said, you know, it has diverse work. This one is that Omidon Dancer, and it's a multimedia artist too. You know, here he uses a you know ceramic glass to project Omidon. You cannot see the lady, you know, outlined by this uh, you know dark color, but he focus just about the image. You can see the hairstyle, you can see the breasts pointed. In African art, when the breast like this one is pointed. It's a sign that that lady or that young woman has the capacity to produce, not only to produce children, but to nurture a child to maturity. You can see the form, you know, all these patterns all over the lady, you know, it's talking about, you know, our, our style, our, 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 you know, our tradition of beauty, you know, as against what we have now. You can see, you know, uh, scarification, uh, body painting and the likes. Here, I talk about the origin of feminism. Here, he used Giemaja. And that for Okiri to produce this work and touch its origin of feminism, he take recourse to his tradition. Again, you can find memory at work here. You see me, Giemaja, you know, and uh, the other, you know, lady. And uh, he believed that this is the origin of feminism. What he just wants to do is to stamp the idea of Africanity, or Africanity on the mind of his viewer. This one is direct, directly, you know, okay, it does shift it from using, you know, paint, you know, on canvas or from using, you know, ceramics, you know, on board. Now, he paint directly on a model. This is Iwalewa, 2016, you know, direct painting. Now, okay, it now explore the human body as a living canvas to explore its creativity. Here is one of the installations of Okidiji. And the argument is that, uh, you know, there's nothing, that computer, you know, uh, more or less is similar to Odrifa. And as a matter of fact, Odrifa in you know, the past 365 corpus, in the divination corpus, you know, that uh, the way you manipulate, you know, computer, you get your data, you know, you cut, you delete, is the same way that the Ifa priest in Yoruba, you know, culture, who also manipulates or explore, you know, or play with these corpuses, you know, to tell the future. You know, to encourage, you know, people not to take certain steps to stop certain things, you know, from happening society. And what he's trying to do is that, uh, you know, it's not saying that we should not be Christian or we should not be Muslims. What he's trying to say is that uh, we should not forget our tradition, we should not forget, you know, where we're coming from. And this one is titled The Man, produced in 2016. You can see the blue thread, you know, human figure here. This work represents, you know, loneliness in the midst of multitude. And that describes our story today. Whether you are an academic, as a market woman, I said the politicians who have that clique, you know, clique, you know, that, you know, or, you know, the cohorts, you know, and they those who they root together. But the average man in Nigeria, the average man in Africa, even in Europe, is just alone, alone, thinking about his issues, thinking, if, you know, about his problem, how to solve that, and there are other multitudes. So there's nothing that is happening to you that it, it has not really affected others too. So your story is not unique, but this man is in his own world. This woman is also in his own world. It's like he's crying. You can see the mouth, you know, open, crying, screaming for her. And uh, you know, as we have migrants, you know, from the high DPS in Zampara, in Sokoto, they are crying, they are screaming for her. You know, they are in captivity to so Boko Haram, to Hesme killings, to injustice here and there, and then nobody hears the scream at all. That's the man. The man could be you and it could be me. And this one is about the history of metals in Africa. You know, you can see, you know, his argument here is that, uh, you know, uh, metal is not, you know, the prerogative of any culture. Even in Africa, we have our ways of discovering, you know, of making metals. And uh, you know, uh, studies told us that uh, even uh, civilization discoveries of the first, the very first of things began in Africa. And they used this painting to actually capture that. So that uh, you, know, have, you know, America or Europe don't, don't uh, believe on this issue that we are inferior or that you are the best. We also have our own way. And he believes something that I want us to share. I want, I want to share with us. He believes that uh, if Africa was left alone to develop at its own pace without being, you know, 
forcefully taken to Americas and to Europe. In America, you know, I mean, I mean, Africa will have been a better place than it is today. So instead of developing our own base, we are forced, like a scholar said, Marshall Man, he said what took you know, Europe and America about 250 years to develop. Where they reach today, it was collapsed in the space of 50 years because of forceful migration, because of colonialism, because of all these, you know, uh, inhuman attitude towards human. You know, you see Bourbon Strait, you know, New Orleans. I believe, you know, you painted this, you can uh, identify, you know, musicians, Pella Nicolaco, you can see Sonia Day, you know, you can see, you know, uh, the singer there, you know, and all, of course this Pella and Nicolaco Omo, Yaje, you know, ink on paper. You know, he also tried to uh, promote and you know, for us to remember our iconic cultural, you know, uh, people, people like Pella Nicolaco, like obey Shino Peters and the likes, whether we like it or not, they have you know they have done a lot you know for the African nation. But unfortunately, Africans do not remember to celebrate their icons. They do forget. This painting is a celebration of Fela, you know, and Nicola Kukuti. This is Akodiorisha. It is very funny I and mean, it's very new. Okediji realized that he has to give back to the society that originally you know producing or giving an opportunity to develop himself, to discover his creativity. So in 2017, he came back to Nigeria, he looked for a place, and then he started working. You know, this place is live and clear in Ilife here. And he referred to it as Akodi Orisha, you know, uh, like uh, the forest of thousand demons, you know, just like, uh, you know, uh, uh, according to uh, Wally Shonika translations of uh, Goju or the Nuburu Mole. Okay, he said of this particular you know, work, he said many of sculptures and architectural sculptures at the Akodi Orisha is an ecological monument depicting the 401 Irumale, Irumale who made the intergalactic land. You know, this is very, you know, very, this is wild. When he, he just repeated that uh, there's no way we can have a video of this particular place. This place is a place for total heart. Okay, G, you know, tries to go back to the to the villages, you know, to the indigenous society, and looking for young ladies and young guys. Come, let us come together and build our own authentic African heart. And this is the edifice, and the work is still there. Wakodi Orisha, you know, is a blend of Yoruba heart, Yoruba aesthetics and culture, an archive of memory and sanctuary of Yoruba distinctive sense of values and spirituality. Yoruba is highly spiritual, no doubt about that, and he has built a monument to celebrate that. This painting is tied to how many Igbo boys have we killed. We remember, it's so fresh in our minds, how you know, the government, the powers that be, they went to the East in the name of trying to curtail you know, the activities of the IPOB. And many Igbo boys were killed, many young, young stars. Glory of Nigeria, they were destroyed in the name of misunderstanding, ideological differences, in the name of restructuring. How many Igbo boys have we killed? This is not just a painting, but a key to critical discourse. That if harming, you know, the, uh, the force are sent to a particular place, must you kill the tomorrow of Nigeria in the name of what? He lamented. You can see the woman crying, carrying the death song, but the death song is no more. Many of these, many of our people in the East today, they are hide, either, you know, Widows, or they had, uh, you know, uh, uh, childless because they've lost their children. So this agitation for restructuring, agitation for you know independence that is regional. This another one, past, present, and the future. Okay, G, you know, is uh, he has love for feminine figures, and that the the best form that he explore is Yemoja, you know. Can see two Yemoja, you know, holding the staff together, and then what he has tried to say that uh, in the realm of the spirit, below the ground, in the underworld, there's no demarcation between the past, between the present, and between the future. It's a continuous existence. And so, for KDG, the issue of migration, the issue of memory, 
It's a continuous narrative. It's an illusion. That's a blow. We are the one that actually give it one thing or the other. That is what he's trying to do here. And you can see, if only at the you can see it's talking about a delivery. There's a time of pregnancy and a time of delivery. Can you use this to remind us that even before the coming of the white men, before you have, you know, gynecologists in our hospitals, Africans have their own way, you know, of bringing forth a newborn into this world. This is the way they used to do it. You see, is the pregnant woman. There's another woman at the, uh, in front of the pregnant woman saying, please push, push. And the other woman at the back trying to hold her. Come on, take her. Just take her. Don't worry. All the way. And by extension, you can see that this work will also represent you know, the birth of Nigeria, you know, <laughs> in 1914, you know, we, we can read this work into so many, so many aspects, different angles. You see so many images, so many patterns, so many, you know, marks, so many forms, so many symbols, which represent Nigeria. This is modern Nigeria, modern nature, traveling to give out, give out, and continue to give out, but the pain is on. Since independence up to now, we are still, you know, you know, in the travails. We are still traveling to bring back or to give back to good governance. You shall see it's a mirage. In conclusion, migration is an important factor in the development of new visual language, according to Jagade, and distinct visual vocabulary. Like I said in my introduction, when an artist moved from Tokyo to South Africa, from South Africa to me, you know, he encounters a lot of things, a lot of ideas, different people, different ideas. At times, he resists. At times, you know, he, 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 you know, he agrees with certain issues. At times, he accommodates, you know, as he does this thing as a critical artist, as an artist that wants to go beyond display of art, you know, you know, art goes beyond this you know, display of skill. It's not about skill. Anybody can paint, anybody can make painting. Anybody can make sculpture, but only very few people like Moyo Kiriji can make works of art to actually attend to the issue of migration and to the issue of memory. And then when we begin to do this thing systematically, consciously, as artists, even as artists, scholars, we realize that our visual language is developed and our vocabulary is increased. As public analysts, artists explore migration and memory as tools of construction and the construction. It's not only Okiriji. But Okiriji, you know, uh, it's, it's an epitome, you know, epitome of artists that explore memory, migration, and other, you know, issues as tool of construction and the construction in the search for identity, the search for meaning and relevance, the multicultural society. Okiriji's work can be summed up as crossroads, like I said, of memories, Fantasies, illusions, traditions, cultural values, and imaginative contemplation. He believes closely that migration has become a means by which we can describe what the artists do today. And this concept can also be used to also talk about other artists, even artists who are not scholars, artists who are just indigenous, who are not as educated as some of us today. And he refers to uh, memory as an illusion, an illusion that by time and space. You are seeing me. Everybody is seeing me. Now. I can see you over there. It's just an illusion. It's just technology made it easy. I can't actually see you because as I'm touching this screen, now, I'm touching my computer. Nothing, no more, no less. But I can see you because technology made it possible. Because we live in a world that is always evolving, a world that is shifting, a world that is being negotiated all the time. And that's why we're having this Zoom meeting for us to negotiate. For us to discuss more and more, okay, we cannot meet, you know, physically. We have so many restrictions, you know, corona restrictions here and there. But we want to talk, and we make use of technology, bring people together all over the world, so that we can just judge up, you know, and discuss issues that pertain to all of us. Boyo Kediji, like I said, you know, on Odysseys span three decades. Today, I mean, this year made it thirty years that he has been in exile. According to him, he said he's an exile. He's in exile. He's a stranger. Whenever he comes around to the university, community, say, hello, how are you, sir? Tell us stories of what is happening there. And when he's going, 
He also tell you another story. So as he's traveling back to the US, he also going with certain issues, certain story. But over the years now, you know, technology, social media, you know, made all these things very, very, very simple. 30 years, it's not a joke. And then, like I said, the other time, you know, okay, the G is a perfect example of a stranger. Okay, I'm writing up now. He's a permanent stranger. You know, he has so many arrivals, he has so many departures. And then with the help of technology, like I said, you know, social media, he has continued to redefine, you know, the perception of people generally about African heart, about African aesthetics, about African language. You know, when I was having a discussion with him, he said, Michael, I'm just having fun. And for many of us as artists, you know, when we engage in creativity, it's a form. It's, you know, we are playing with memories. We are playing with ideas. We are trying to, we don't know what we are doing, but at the end of the day, you can see this is what we have done. You can see what you're here. You know, apart from painting, it's also into installation. And this is the Google. And this is, you know, uh, you know, display last Christmas in Austin. University of Austin, at, you know, uh, of Texas at Austin, last December, just to let them know that they were, even though I'm not, I, I, I'm not in my land, but I'm still in my land. That's the power of memory. You know, for him, he believed that, uh, uh, you know, he's just doing what he's, uh, you know, a letter I sent him to do. You know, Ori, Yoruba, you know, uh, concepts, you know, of destiny. Thank you, and God bless you for having me. Yeah, so I think, um... This is a beautiful one, and um, I enjoyed every part of this, this uh, discussion. You can see everyone is clapping for you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Nina William is clapping for you and clapping for you, Thank you and so, much. so many others. So well done. Thank you for this beautiful presentation and presentation because this slides are beautiful. The connection of AFMQ is a very brilliant performance. We really appreciate you. Now, we, I, I really appreciate the fact that behind every work of art, there's a story. That is yes. one point that I admire so much. And also that art is a social construct and art is a journey. These were some of my jottings because I really like those expressions. It's a journey, art is a sojourner, moving from place to place. Of course, the connection between us and migration is very clear to us with this beautiful discussion that artists migrate from one place to the other and so they carry their memory along so that they recall and they are ever moving. In fact, when I saw the topic, I said, what kind of topic is this? I couldn't place where it, is, it was coming from. But now listening to you, I really appreciate it. I thank you. And I want to also say, especially I thank uh, Dr. Felicia Oame, who was the link between me and uh, Dr. Fadu Ibe. And uh, I ask more people to please kindly give us such beautiful links so that we have more nice presentations on this platform. Dr. Felicia contacted them and uh, I just took over from her and that was it. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, there's one of our professors here, the former director of the Center of Excellence in uh, Migration and Global Studies, uh, Professor Akimi Bikunle Tijani, uh, who is all the way in the uh, uh, US, Maryland, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he is very early there and he made effort to wake up and join us as early as 6 a.m. He's been loading a lot of uh, uh, questions and uh, comments on this chat box and he wants me to read it out, but I think he's still around. So since I can still see him live, so I will give him the yes. chance to express himself. So maybe some of the things, he has so many nice questions. He's an eco man, so he knows a, a, some ads. <laughs> so let's give him a chance. So Prof, quickly make your comments while we'll I take others thereafter. Thank, thank you very much, Director. Thank you. And uh, I believe my voice is audible enough. Uh, let me start by congratulating uh, Dr. Faji Igwe for this brilliant presentation. In my initial chat, I stated that I will not be able to speak uh, because I didn't want to wake up my people, but I couldn't but speak by his grace as he rounded up. And uh, 
you also triggered my desire. Chose to speak and you know show my face because of your statement. And what was that? Complimenting Dr. Felicia Oame, the production editor. I believe she still has that title and an associate uh, fellow. So what is important about the link is that when you do such service, not only to the center, but to the university, it will harm you something you will never expect it. Dr. Associate Professor Aneto got this position because of a Excellent connection when I serve as a foundation director. And I just want to alert others like Felicia, like uh, Oparaduru, like uh, uh, Williams, like uh, the, the rest of us will continue to do that. Secondly, I would like to say that this attendance is really, really poor. Yeah. And where the good thing about it is that a few of us benefited from this distinguished presentation and sharing of knowledge by Dr. Fadri. And please, thank you for circulating the PowerPoint. You can see from my comment that yeah, it's frozen. Let's hope you will come back. Um, Dr. Emina, can you? I am back. Okay, you are back. Okay. I am. Okay. Uh, you know, I've made my comment and I would like you to share with uh, Dr. the presenter. But let me quickly go back to this metal, metal technology because I'll be expecting, as you are expecting, as everyone is expecting, for him to put it in what format and then allow us to peer review and publish, right? The meta in Africa must be contextualized within the issue of ion technology as the genesis of global technology, but more importantly, the place of Africa to deconstruct the Eurocentric view. And I will advise if you have not, uh, to read UNESCO series, particularly volume one, where ion technology is contextualized with evidence that the origin was indeed in Africa, as far back as 2 BC, okay? And, uh, but the general thing apart from what I've posted that I would like you to share with, with him, but I don't want to hold, uh, people uh, spend much more time. You know, I can speak to you tomorrow. I'm a historian. It's the fact that <laughs> I will implore a presenter to kindly interview Okay, DJ again in Austin. We need to know more about his ethnogenesis because in several art forms and the poetic verses, we have not heard about that mushy connection where he was bat and where the foundation was given. Okay, we need to know more, the influence of Mushin. And then you need to look at the work of Sandra Barnes and by his grace, my work that follows Sandra Barnes about Mushin. Again, thank you very much for uh, Thank you very much. I really want to commend uh, Dr. Michael. You know, I think one of the major problems we have in Africa is um, when you see an artwork, interpreting it is always very difficult. You know, to the ordinary layman on the street, you just walk past it and just think it's a mere pictorial um, post that is just there. Honestly, today's presentation has even opened my eyes, even, you know, in my quest to acquire more knowledge. I think a lot of things can be interpreted in arts. I am more interested in the social construct, you know, uh, which art depicts to us. And to an ordinary man who walks on the streets, 
you know, there is so much in his mental form, but how does he put it down? Even in, in our rural communities, we have some of these things that are just there, idling away. How do we explain them? What has happened in that generation? It could also be that it's just a way of expressing a particular event that took place in a neighborhood. How do we galvanize them? How, how, do, how do we share this interconnectedness between uh, the anthropologists, the sociologists, and the, uh, I mean, there are diverse forms with which art can be ex you know, explained, even the sciences. And um, for instance, you have just given us a pictorial evidence of how many Igbos, you know, uh, can we kill, you know, or have we killed, I mean, in 2021. When, when you show that pictorial evidence, I just couldn't imagine it. I, I, I could just see it on the road and, and walk away. How do I explain this? You know, so I think in the art world, they need to really go a little bit further to create this awareness, especially from the, the uh, primary schools where, you know, art can be discussed because we are, lo we are losing it. Our young generations are losing. They don't even know that more messages can be passed through art. So for me, I really want to thank you today. I, I, I'm going to now take more interest in looking at it from uh, the sociological impact and what arts can bring in terms of development to, to, to our national economy and our cultural our relationship with other parts of the world. You know, so I, and especially now that some of our artifacts are being returned. So you can now see Africa has been explored. All of a sudden, it's on the other way back. So how do we explain, you know, that some of these things that were stolen all of a sudden are being repatriated back? So how do we say, how do we explain this story? Will be another thing I'm looking forward to the art world to really portray or put forward. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Michael. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate your comments and questions. And then what I want to quickly, ask uh, Dr. Michael to further tell us the advantages he has mentioned of migration. I think I was able to pick that. But regarding us, are there disadvantages? Or is it all sweet all the way? Let us go into some of the challenges too. So can you yeah, explain a few to us? Prof, Prof I, I sent you a chat. I don't know whether you've read it, sir. Kindly help me check. Professor Tijani. So yes, I, 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 I want others to ask, but in the absence of uh, more questions, maybe you take these first three. Okay, somebody has uh, his hand up. Sorry, is it uh, Professor Folaromi? I don't know your title, but yeah. let me call um, you Prof. That is okay. Stephen Folaromi is just okay. Um, you asked the questions about disadvantages. Um, do you mean disadvantages of studying art or Disadvantages of um, uh, of the profession. I mean, I no, I, I, want, yeah. I was asking the speaker to tell us the disadvantages of uh, concerning migration to us. Okay. Does it have any negative uh, parts at all? Okay. I want to okay. highlight on that a little. Yes. Oh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. I'll I'll leave the uh, presenter to. To yes, to that. thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, if Dr. Ebena, is your hand still up or if not put okay? So looks like uh, those are just a few questions. I'm sure everybody enjoyed the presentation to the extent that uh, they don't really have what to ask. So we we'll give the presenter the opportunity to, to answer the, uh, the questions and uh, react to the comments. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, thank you for the comments so far. I will take the question from the rear, the last one, uh, the disadvantages of migration to artistic creativity. Uh, for me personally, uh, there is no disadvantage as such because the artist is a creative person. So where you find issues, obstacles, he moves around it, around it, he walks around it to create his own ideas about such particular disadvantages. So the artist, he, he, he 
he, he explores as he moves from place to place, he documents visually in his drawing power. At times, he writes down certain things so that he could be able to produce a very good work of art that would depict such experience. So the only disadvantage, if there could be any, is the fact that uh, the artist is not so honored. The artist is not all that accepted. The artist is not respected, even in his own land. And that is why you see the issue of uh, being a constant stranger. He moves from place to place. And it has been said that a prophet has no honor in his own land. And that is what is the, one of the evils that is befalling the hardest and his profession today, especially in Africa. Nigeria is a very sad, sad thing. I don't know whether I got your question right, but I know disadvantages so far, I can see. But if there's any disadvantage at all, is the fact that, uh, you know, the people, like uh, Professor um, uh, William, Emina uh, Williams said, people don't even value hearts. They do not even value the works produced by the artist. How do you value him? How do you value the message that he has to you know, pass across? Like I said the other time, the creation of works of art is not just about display skill. Art must be used as a tool for discourse to make us better, to make us normal, to make us more humane. It must you know, arouse us towards goodness. Yoruba call it didara. So if you encounter a work of art and there's something does not strike within you to pause and to reflect, is that the artist has failed to do his job effectively or we don't really have the critical eyes to see what he has for us. Thank you so much, uh, Professor um, Akim, for that uh, insight concerning meta technology. I will, you know, I will make sure that I get that material on UNESCO and your technology in Africa. That's very good. And to the question of, uh, same, okay, same question to, from Professor Akin, ethnogenesis of Moyo KDG, the influence of Mushi, is actually because of our time, I don't want to really go into details of his childhood, his background and the likes. And that's why I summarize it that Okidiji grew up in the midst of so many personalities. Some personalities are commendable, some are not commendable. He grew up in you know, that mushi, that ghetto area. And that is why he can res resonate with the issues, with the challenges of people in the ghetto, people, you know, uh, in the periphery of the cities. He can as well, you know, resonate with what is happening, you know, in the corridors of power because he had the opportunity of mingling you know, with these scholars. And the one thing that is so crucial for us that I didn't mention is that Okidiji's father you know, constituted you know, a very great influence on his artistic you know, uh, uh, creativity and uh, you know, journey so far, because his father happened to be uh, one of the foremost, if not the pioneer of uh, Yoruba fiction you know, in Nigeria. You know, some of us who are Yoruba you know, will remember very well known, and then some other, you know, uh, as well as, you know, a, a title like that, in which, you know, the artist, the artist, uh, let me, the father, uses, you know, the literary work to investigate so many issues that have to do with corruption, that has to do, do with the, uh, unionism and the likes. So it's just because of time, but I will remember to factor in such influences into it. You say you have a work on Sandra Barnes and Professor Akin. You also said that you have written something on, on this. I wouldn't mind, you know, you can have access to these books or these materials so that it will enrich my articulation of that concept. Another question has to do with uh, the difficulty of understanding, of understanding art, you know. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Emina. You know, the problem is that we don't care to listen. We don't care even to look at what artists have produced, what they are producing. In my Yoruba culture here, they say, Oluya. 
Only I mean somebody who is just, you know, winding, you know, playing around, an unserious person. So when you are described by your own people, by your own community, you know, scholars, even the university environment, you begin to wonder what are these people doing? It's not just about art, about drawing. And so they refuse to give the necessary funding for the heart to flourish. But we can do much more, you know, as artists, as scholars, as we begin to use art, you know, as a point of critical discourse, as an intersection. Like you said, you know, the anthropologists, the ethnographers, the scientists, you know, and the, the philosophers. Because the artist is a historian. The artist is a prophet. The artist, you know, is so many things. He's even a scientist because he provides a platform for the visual display of whatever the society, you know, is doing, the social evolution, the evolution, and whatever, you know, goes on around the premise of the artist. Create more awareness about our okay, yes. Uh, you know, one of the challenges of uh, teaching art today in Nigeria is the fact that uh, fine art, you know, is not given its preeminent you know, place in our curriculum. Right now it's been matched with drama, with music. So in primary school, in secondary school, it is tied to creative art. And by creative art, you are referring to music, you are referring to this, uh, 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 to drama, you are referring to dance, you are to finance. So most of the students, because they were not properly groomed from the primary to secondary, they see art as a no-go area, except maybe for the purpose of, uh, you know, let me just go to university and get, uh, you know, uh, a degree. And that's the problem. So for this particular question, we just need to continue to appeal to the government that uh, if there's any way by which we can actually teach values. We can actually orientate our young ones concerning values that matter in society, in governance, in politics. It is through art, through the works of art. And it should not be long together with others. I don't know whether I've answered the question. Yes. Uh, too much. I you, have you, have, you have answered the questions. But um, I'm sorry to say that uh, most of the postings of uh, Professor Jani to me was lost when I had to log out and uh, because I had a challenge. However, there's a comment he has there on the, on the chat that he just posted. He said, concepts, double consciousness and triadic relationships in OKDG's work, controversial OKDG, the ego painting. I don't know whether you got that, uh, Dr. Uh, please, uh, the director, sorry, uh, Doc. I would like you to look into those uh, in a post presentation because I, I don't want to, you know, hold us. I think it's past seven. Oh, sorry, it's past four there. <laughs> it's just uh, seven nineteen. Yeah. So uh, you are six hours ahead, except if the director says you should respond. Those concepts are germane for your paper when you uh, develop it. As for the sources that I mentioned, you can check even IFE library or UI library. Uh, UNESCO series is popular. Uh, Adubuai edited, uh, and then volume one. Uh, Sandra Barnes, you can even get it online. And uh, my work, even with uh, Professor KDG and uh, Professor Afolabi at UT Austin, they can provide for you uh, the, the works that I have uh, cited. Uh, that will really add value. But again, thank you very much. I personally learned those hundreds that choose not to be here, I, I think they lost a lot. And our advocacy should be to now, all of us, through art forms, through writing, through giving interviews, uh, talk to Ted Form and the government that the idea of sponsoring STEM alone you know, the, the third phone board in particular, uh, they created this center. Why would you in the world say you are sponsoring only STEM uh, scholar? There is no survivor, there is no way STEM will survive without the humanities. We keep saying it. And I think Dr. Aneto will agree because if, if she's not agreeing with us, 
uh, she's still associating with the professors. Her papers will go out. And uh, some of us may. <laughs> so, so it's important, you know, on a more serious note, it's important that we advocate. You know, I was happy reading finally the Senate or the House passed the teaching of history. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. We did that some years when they put us in mosquito infested hotels in Lagos and Abuja. We were traveling with our money as VP of Historical Society of Nigeria. And then the, the thing we wrote the curriculum and they took it from us because you have to write and submit, you can't leave. And, uh, but we are, we are delighted that uh, the National Assembly finally stamp it. And uh, we need to do more advocacy uh, beyond yes. our intellectualism. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if uh, the speaker wants to round off with one sentence, just one sentence, but before that, before the one sentence, I want to say, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. But I will tell you that from my own experience, it's not easy to even be an artist. That is my own experience. Because when I was in secondary school, I tried doing fine arts and I never got beyond 40% anytime. And that frustrated me out of it. Because when they say we should draw the thing, I would think I've done my best and the artist, our teacher will come and be circling and saying this one, I didn't get the nose where, I didn't get the mouth where. I said, please let this art come and do and go. Let me leave it quickly for those who know. And it's something that requires good talent. People are talented to do arts. I don't think everybody can say, I want to go and study art. So I personally, I respect artists. And I must say, don't say people don't respect them because we know it's a brain work and it's a gift to be an artist. It's not anybody that can run into that field. So we really appreciate you. But if you want to say a last sentence, a last word, just to round off, I'll give you one minute and then we'll bring this okay. meeting to a close. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Director. I want to just you know, round off uh, by quoting uh, John Melvin Ascolitz, an anthropologist, and uh, he defined art as the embellishment of ordinary living that is acquired with skill, having a describable form. In other words, we are all artists. The way you dress up this morning is a form of art. In your office over there, it's a form of art. We engage in art every now and every day. And it's our duty to engage art more consciously to discuss issues that pertain to our collective goodness. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So it's nice having you. And I want to also challenge uh, Dr. Fadu Igbe to help us look for more resource persons for this platform. I People will. in arts, why not? People in the sciences, why not? And the social sciences, whatever, please, we need more resource persons. We really appreciate you. We thank you and thank everyone for making our time to be with us. Even though we are not many, but I'm sure we've gained a lot. And believe you me, this is being recorded and it will go places. So more people will have to view it even when they are not here. But it's better to be here to see because the taste of the pudding is in the eating. Thank you so much. Have a nice yes. day.